and welcome in the, to the latest in our speaker series from the project on China's global shark power at the Hoover Institution. I am Glenn Tiffert, manager of the project, and today I'd like to welcome our guest, Professor David Owenby, who's professor of history at the University of Montreal in Canada. Professor Owenby has worked on a variety of topics in Chinese history, including the history of secret societies, popular religion, and modern and contemporary China, and he's currently working on contemporary Chinese establishment intellectuals. He directs the Reading the China Dream Project, which is a website devoted to the world of establishment intellectual thought in contemporary China. And today he's going to highlight some of the trends in political thinking in the Xi Jinping era. Uh, Professor Owendi's most recent work includes uh, co-editing The Voices from the Chinese Century uh, and an article in La Pensée en Chine, uh, a collection of uh, articles on intellectuals in China. I'd like to welcome Professor Owendi. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you to the institution and the staff to set this up. And thanks to all who are listening in. Let me begin with a brief description of what my project is that Glenn just mentioned, because I'm assuming that not everyone is as yet an avid reader of the Reading the China Dream Project. As Glenn just said, what I study are Chinese establishment intellectuals or public intellectuals, who are people who write in Chinese, of course, with an eye toward being read by large numbers of people, thereby influencing public opinion or perhaps even public policy, but who are not writing propaganda. They of course have to respect the rules of the game as decided by what my friend Tim Chi calls the directed public sphere in China, but they navigate these rules on their own as relatively free agents, not as agents of the state. There were large numbers of these people and large numbers of venues in which they published with great frequency. These people are not dissidents, although many are critical of the regime in various ways. The definition of what's a dissident and what is a critic is quite blurry in China. We in the West like to focus on dissidents because the history of the Cold War, because of the history of the Cold War and our animosity toward communism in general. The existence of dissidents proves to us that our view of the world is right. This may or may not be true, but there is a rich, diverse world of thought and public opinion in China, which is neither dissidence nor government propaganda, and about which we are almost completely ignorant. The way I like to think about this is to say that while Chinese intellectuals cannot say everything they want to say, this does not mean that they cannot say anything they want to say. This world of public intellectuals in China is important for any number of reasons. I'll just mention three here. First, as we all know, China is the world's number two power, America's chief competitor or rival. And we know almost nothing about what Chinese intellectuals think. In itself, this is a serious lack of intelligence, lack of knowledge, especially when we compare it to how much Chinese intellectuals know about us, our thought, our politics, it's a great deal. And the, the asymmetry in that is stunning, is stunning. Second, when we imagine that all Chinese intellectuals are dissidents and that the Chinese regime is hanging by a thread, we commit a grave error. If we really believe this, we're fooling ourselves. The regime is not collapsing. Large numbers of intellectuals are loyal to the regime. Third, the image of China as projected in the talking points of the US government, which is largely followed by the media, is so extreme from a Chinese point of view that Chinese intellectuals cannot see themselves in it. This makes me think of uh, about 15 years ago, I was talking with a Chinese colleague who was at the time at my university. And he said, it's like we were once really, really obese and we lost all this weight. And instead of saying, you look good, we kept saying in a certain light, your butt still looks really big. In other words, we have changed a lot, we've evolved a lot, and you refuse to recognize it. Now, since Xi Jinping came to power, I think China has fallen off its diet and gained a fair bit of weight back, but the point still stands that China deserves respect for bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And we generally refuse to acknowledge much of anything even moderately positive about China. This makes diplomacy very difficult when two people sit down to negotiate something and they cannot see themselves and how the others see them at all, there, there is little way to advance. 
I'll add a little corrective here for those who are already thinking they're wasting their time by listening to me. I am hawkish on China. It seems to me that there is no other choice but to be hawkish on China. Uh, the bad behavior is a fact we have to acknowledge and push back against. But the fact remains that the dissonance we talk about in our media exist alongside this other much larger world that we almost never talk about, a diverse pluralistic world of thought that Chinese President Xi Jinping can't stand, and with which, if we knew how, we might be able to make common cause. If you're still skeptical, I can only tell you that I would have been too before I started my project about a decade ago. I can tell you briefly how I started to do this. As Glenn said, I've worked on a bunch of different stuff. At some point, I was at a conference in Vancouver. I can't even remember what the topic was. My friend Tim Cheek invited me. And also at the conference was a Chinese intellectual named Xu Jilin, a famous historian from East China Normal University, whom Tim has worked on for many years. Uh, Professor Xu gave me his most recent book, which had something to do with the history of modern Chinese intellectuals. And on the flight back from Vancouver to Montreal, which takes about five hours, I ran out of things to read or my Kindle batteries went dead, I don't know. And I pulled out Xu's book and started to read it. And I was astonished to find that it was interesting, well-written, I could not put it down. Until that point, it had never occurred to me that Chinese academic writing could be good, it could be pleasant to read. I did simply, I didn't know. I hadn't, it had never occurred to me, as I just said. Stuff I'd worked on in the past, be it secret societies or religion, uh, academic writing on those topics was worth what it was worth from an academic point of view, but it was not written in such a way that I would ever want to read it outside of my professional obligations. Xu, Jin, uh, Xu Jilin's work was as good as Barbara Tuckman's or Simon Shama's or anybody that you think of as being good to read. It had no party ideology. I couldn't find any Marxism or any socialism in there at all. It told its own story in very nice prose. And this was just a revelation to me. So I thought, if I didn't know about this, probably other people don't know about it either. So I put on my uh, agenda the idea that someday I would start to explore that. And when I and did this certain project, I started doing that. And the first thing I did was work together with this author, Xu Jilin, to put together a book of essays that I translated and wrote the introduction to. It's about China's rise and how a liberal views China's rise. And it was great fun. I learned an incredible amount of doing that. He was writing a lot about China's contemporary intellectual scene. And I, as I worked through his footnotes to finish the book, uh, that allowed me to come into contact with that world to know who the players are and what they had to say. And so I kept at it. And as Glenn said a few minutes ago, a couple of years ago, I started this website called uh, Reading the China Dream on which I post every two weeks or so new translations of authors that strike me as interesting. I cover the entire field from uh, New Confucians to liberals to the new left. Uh, and it's got about a half a million hits since I started doing things. So it has been quite an adventure and I'm enjoying myself and I'm hoping that I'm making a, a contribution with the public service that I think this is. Okay, I could give a longish lecture on the history of where this world that we do know nothing about came from, but time is limited, so I'll just give a quick version. This world is the product of the reform and opening period in China, which for Chinese intellectuals has meant globalization, the multiplication of exchanges with academics outside of China, massive investments in the best of Chinese universities, the rise of the internet, which has sped information flow and provided new publication venues, and the relative liberalization of party control over intellectual life. This is certainly not without exceptions and major bumps in the road, but globally speaking, things are vastly different from and better than conditions under Mao Zedong. And most intellectuals can say much of what they want to say much of the time although they always keep their eyes and ears open. 
Beginning about 2000, the year 2000, these factors came together with China's rise, uh, geopolitical rise, to produce a sea change in the Chinese intellectual world, which accelerated beginning in 2008 with the US global financial crisis. This crisis spread throughout the Western world and it's still working its way out. In a nutshell, China's rise together with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the apparent decline of the US convinced many Chinese intellectuals that history is at a fundamental turning point. A turning point like that when monarchies fell to be replaced by democracies or like when America took Britain's place as the primary world leader. But this time we're moving toward China's century when China will rule the world. They were serious about this, this is what they actually think. This of course produced a certain amount of chest thumping and self-congratulation but this was not terribly interesting from an intellectual point of view. What was more interesting to me was that many Chinese public intellectuals took advantage of this moment to fundamentally rethink pretty much everything, China and the world's past, present and future. Because if you think about it, if both the American and Soviet models are obsolete, if they're passe, that means that almost literally everything you know is wrong. The way that we think about the world, our analytic tools, you have to go back to the drawing board. So that's what Chinese intellectuals did. And between 2000 and roughly, roughly between 2000 and 2015, there was an explosion of intellectual activity in China unseen since the Republican period. Extremely creative, very rich, very diverse, lots of debates, lots of arguments, uh, very hard to follow. There are lots of examples of this. I could talk for much longer than you want to listen. Uh, new Confucian scholars, for instance, rewrote key moments of Chinese history, like the May 4th movement. May 4th movement in 1919, followed by several years of ferment, is usually interpreted as the moment where Chinese intellectuals decided to break with the Confucian past and turn toward the West. And that's sort of a key turning point in modern Chinese history. And it's generally seen and celebrated as something positive. These new, new Confucians insisted that this was a negative, that it was a problem because China had chosen Western solutions to Chinese problems. And by Western solutions, they meant both liberal democracy and Soviet socialism. These new Confucians had to tread carefully around the Mao era because he remained sacrosanct but what they wind up saying is that China's present success is the result of China's rediscovering her cultural essence, getting in touch with her ever power, powerful tradition. So this is modernization without modernization theory, without socialism, without liberal democracy. They're pretty fuzzy on how it happened, but we did it because we're Chinese is what they wound up saying. Another example, uh, in 2005, an intellectual named Gan Yang gave a talk at Tsinghua University where he talked about unifying the three traditions. Uh, he was trying to explain China's rise. And he said China's rise came about because we managed to put together uh, three traditions that have marked modern Chinese history. These three traditions are Confucian personalism, the notion that we care a lot about who we know, our family, friends, and people we share common places with, a Maoist sense of justice and injustice, and then Deng Xiaoping's market, market efficiency. And the notion here, Tung San Tung, we're um, unifying the three traditions, is an old Confucian trope that aims to explain how Confucianism came together after a series of early dynasties, pre-Confucian dynasties. We're very different in terms, in various terms but they got past their differences and put together a Confucian order that lasted forever. And what Gan Yang is trying to say is that we've managed to do the same thing. We've overcome our differences. We've chosen these three parts of our heritage and we've knitted them together to become something wonderful. Now, in some ways, this strikes me as silly. It's when you're at a difficult juncture in a national history, you can't just choose elements like from a Chinese menu and I'll say, take one from column A, one from column B and one from column C. But this idea of the three traditions became a 
a trope that animated Chinese intellectuals for about 15 years. And there are endless debates about what traditions they should be. And they switch from being descriptive to prescriptive. And all of this is part of this larger effort to redefine how we understand China and the world. And the goals of the exercise were multiple, but among the most important were first, to create new founding myths for modern China. The idea basically is that if revolution was not China's thing, then what was? And related to this was a second point, uh, the goal of creating a continuous history of Chinese greatness avoiding the history of revolutionary rupture. So the exercise was both conservative and utopian at the same time. This is the China dream, and some version of it was animating Chinese intellectuals before Xi Jinping made it a major political slogan at the beginning of his mandate in 2012. Although after, even after he came to power, there was a longish moment where Chinese public intellectuals and Xi Jinping sort of tried to make common cause with the intellectuals providing content to this slogan of the China dream. I've got this firsthand from any number of Chinese intellectuals who were pitching ideas at the time, hoping that Xi Jinping or the Politburo would pick up on them and adopt Confucian content or new left content and make that into the China dream. Because the China dream is make China great again. It's the equivalent of MAGA. And they were hoping to provide it with more specific content. It's important to note that this exercise, the China dream exercise was not really about freedom or at least not freedom from communist tyranny. Americans in the West had imagined that as China developed democracy and freedom would emerge naturally and organically, but it did not. Why not? Part of this, I think, uh, came out of different readings of the meaning of the fall of the Soviet Union. Americans thought this was great. We've been hoping for the fall of Soviet Union communism for years and years and years. It affirmed our view of history and of ourselves. Chinese had, I don't know how much love was lost between Chinese and Soviets, but that was their system that fell apart pretty much overnight. So they didn't celebrate that at all. What they saw was the possibility of widespread political disorder, the dissolution of empire and the loss of influence. And it scared them profoundly and, and influenced how they thought in ways that I'm not sure we've, well, specialists have picked up on it. I'm not sure how much general China watchers have caught that. Uh, another reason was that during this time, uh, after 2008, particularly, uh, in economic terms, China seemed to be competing quite well, or even doing better than the West. The uh, Chinese were quite proud of having navigated the financial crisis in ways that they saw as being superior to how the US and the West handled it. So why would they need freedom and democracy when they were winning that battle? So to sum up this part of my talk, between 2000 and 2015, we see the emergence of a world of thought in China, which can only be called pluralistic, which was paying relatively little, relatively little attention to the Communist Party or to Communist ideology. There was lots of energy in this world, but very little of it directed at the party state, although little of the energy was, was dissident in any way either. Uh, Xi Jinping hates this pluralism and is attempting to reimpose discipline. I think in the long run he will fail and that this intellectual world that I have described will outlast him for any number of reasons. Chinese intellectuals first don't like discipline. There's a real anarchist cast to the Chinese character in this sense. They don't much like Xi Jinping in general. They probably make fun of his intellectual pretensions. But even if they do outlast him, this may not mean that freedom and democracy will triumph in China. And I'll illustrate this with a, a brief case study, which is something I've been working on very recently. Last time I updated my site at the beginning of this month, I included, I translated a piece by an intellectual named Min Jintao, 
who he was born in 1962. He is a curious kind of guy. He's a he's a liberal, but a very classical liberal. He likes Hayek. He thinks England started going downhill when John Stuart Mill allowed that utilitarianism had some meaning and turned his back on individual liberty. He's also a Confucian of some sort. Uh, I, he was on my radar because he is a good friend of uh, a man named Gao Chuanxi, who was a constitutional scholar at Jiao Tong University in Shanghai, also a classical liberal, a great Edmund Burke lover, and a Trump supporter. Uh, Rin Jintao is also buddies with uh, Xu Zhangrun, the Tsinghua law professor who became a dissident. He said that Xi Jinping was a clown and has lost pretty much everything for it. So I thought that I understood who, who Ren was. And anyway, I just, I had stumbled upon something he wrote, a talk he gave to a foundation in January. It was about the right length and the right degree of difficulty for a contemporary piece. So I translated it. And then I was making, I was looking around the web to see who it really was, because I write introductions to these pieces. And I stumbled across, or I found on his um, Chinese Wikipedia page, uh, information that he had given a speech at a Credit Suisse investment seminar in 2012, in which he had said that uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises had been hijacked by 200 families that China's economy is going to collapse, uh, a whole bunch of stuff like this, and that the internet, that his speech was blocked in China. And this was kind of surprising to me. I usually know before I start doing due diligence on my guys or girls, whether they are dissidents or not. This doesn't come up when I, when I do, it doesn't often come up. So I decided to look into it. And when I looked into it, I discovered first the context when this happened was very important. Uh, the speech was given in Hong Kong the week after Bo Xilai was deposed from his position in Chongqing as mayor of Chongqing. Bo Xilai was uh, is believed to have been Xi Jinping's competitor for the eventual position uh, as general secretary or president. He lost out in very complicated ways um, and this was a really big deal in China when Xi Jinping, when Bo Xilai was arrested and, and expelled from the party. It was, I think everybody in China was as tense during this time as most Americans were between the election and Biden's assumption of power. People were just really nervous. Uh, so I suspected that maybe Ren's speech, the fact that he was more open or critical was because of that. In addition, I decided to look at what else he wrote during the year 2012. There's a website in China called uh, I Love Thought, which to me sounds a little bit too much like uh, Hello Kitty. It's a terrible title for a site. But anyway, it's a warehouse for the articles written by famous Chinese intellectuals, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of them. And Ren Jintao, who teaches at Tsinghua, has his site on there. And I went and looked at what he wrote. He wrote 12 essays. He published 12 essays in 2012, a feat I have certainly never achieved. And I spent the last 10 days or so going through them to see whether I was being played, whether, you know, whether what he said in public and what he said in private were completely different things, which is what lots of people think. I get emails from sometimes from people saying, Professor Oinby, do you not realize that these people are Chinese communists? They can't possibly be saying anything interesting, which I think is not true, but there's always a su suspicion. And here I had the evidence to compare the talk he gave outside of China, uh, when he perhaps didn't know he was being filmed, with everything he had said over the course of a year. So I went through his, quickly, through his writings, uh, in 2012, to find that he had said in print, not with the same fervor or with the same daring, he had said 
exactly, almost exactly the same thing many times. Uh, in fact, his my guess that his speaking notes from before his talk at Hong Kong came from an article he published in January, which said pretty much the same thing. And what he said was, uh, the bills are coming due, that China is following a number of different economic and political cycles. It's not working anymore. China will collapse. The economy has been hijacked by uh, powerful interests. And he repeated this theme over the course of his writings throughout 2012 uh, in various different ways, talking about the importance of society, talking about uh, at the end of the year, he published a long piece on how the reform of socialist, socialist economies is just impossible because there are no property rights and without property rights, there are no markets. So that means economic activity is almost completely politically driven. Uh, he did not come out and say directly that this is China's fate. He directed his remarks at the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but he did not say either China is a glaring exception to this rule. Our party state is wonderful. He repeated over and over again that a communist party can be very useful in certain revolutionary situations, but it very quickly outlived its usefulness and stands in the way of uh, meaningful reform. There are also essays over the course of the year in which he praised Confucianism, saying that if you look at it properly, you can find that there, China has its own constitutional tradition growing out of Confucian balance of power. There are two essays in which he talks about the positive importance of religion, saying that the world, the 20th century shows that the world has outgrown its secularism. Secularism has its usefulness, but in terms of allowing society to function as it should, we have to respect their spiritual resources as well. And in the same way that China during the reform and opening period backed off and let the economy run its own course, they have to allow spiritual markets to function as well. Um, I, I would never have guessed if I'd read just, read just the translation of a couple of these things I would not have guessed he was Chinese. Many of these pieces read like they could come out of the Heritage Foundation or the American Enterprise Institute or any number of conservative think tanks. So what do I conclude from this? First, I am not being played in the sense that Chinese intellectuals, at least insofar as this case is valid, are not saying one thing in public and another thing, another thing in private. They may say it differently, but in terms of content, Rin Jintao was completely consistent, even when he was out of the country and speaking in an audience that was not necessarily a Chinese audience. The second thing I conclude is that Chinese liberals, because he still is a Chinese liberal, can be really sort of strange and not at all what we think they are. Uh, he, again, he's one of these very classical kind of liberals who believes very much in property rights and uh, British traditions of liberalism and talks relatively little about freedom and liberty. The third thing, I must admit that from the point of view of the C CCP, you can sort of see why they might want to bring these guys back down to earth. I mean, he, I don't think he said a positive word about China over the course of all of his writings in 2012. He managed to pull this off by writing very abstract pieces where he pulled back from the brink of saying, uh, China is messing up or our model cannot work. But what he wanted to say is perfectly clear. And that's what he wanted to say, that we're headed toward a complete disaster. We don't change and allow property rights and all the rest that comes with that. So for someone like Xi Jinping, um, this is not what you want to hear necessarily. Finally, I'm not at all sure to what extent Xi Jinping has been able to rein in people like Lin Jintao. Uh, of course, his buddy Xu Zhangrun uh, has been reined in in ways that are very painful and I make no apologies for whatsoever. On the other hand, his buddy 
Bill Chuanxi continues to write away, publish away, as do many other people who share these ideas that are profoundly different from what uh, Xi Jinping is preaching. So my thought basically is that despite what Xi Jinping has done, it is very hard to rein in these large numbers of people who have been doing what they want to do for a long time and who have large numbers of outlets to say what they want to say. Uh, and I'm going to compare shortly uh, the writings of Rin Jintao in 2020. He published another 11 essays in 2020, which are also available on the same website. So over the next couple of weeks, I will go through those and make a comparison with what he wrote in 2012 to see it's sort of a measure of what influence Xi Jinping has had in trying to reimpose discipline. I'll stop there because I've been talking far too long and I can tell that Glenn is wanting to jump back in. So thank you very much for your attention. David, thank you so much for that very eye-opening exposure to the diversity of intellectual thought in China, especially um, uh, under Xi Jinping, because um, the party state has sort of grabbed so much of the spotlight that we sometimes forget that there is much more going on that we need to be paying attention to. So I want to encourage those in the audience to use the Q&A function uh, to pose questions. We already have a number of those, and we'll turn to those in a few minutes. But David, I wanted to start with a few questions that I had for for you. Um, PRC thinkers obviously are not alone in struggling to define what it means to be modern or in their dialogue with tradition as they try to work out what that problem. You know, you could say the US is still very much in the throes of that right now. But in China, the process has been and continues to be especially turbulent, more so than even in other Chinese polities, such as Taiwan and Hong Kong, and even in, say, Japan and Korea, which at least for the last 60 years seem to have navigated the question of tradition and modernity and how to reconcile them with a sure footing. Why is that, do you think? Well, I think the entire... 20th century Chinese experience is turned around that question of why do we keep failing? Is it our fault? Why can't we be modern? Uh, I mean, the search for modern China is the title of Jonathan Spence's book, and it all turns around identity. The thing I have noticed, this, this still comes up to a, a fair degree in the stuff that I've done, but lots of times they're kind of getting over it. I feel like it's less uh, wrenching. Uh, something about China's rise and again, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the supposed decline of the US makes them think maybe we've been trying too hard. Maybe we can find a way to be uh, at ease with our traditions. And that's, that's what all that unifying the three traditions is all about. Uh, that that's where that comes from, and it, it's it's quite even in the even within liberals. I think this notion that we have to stop being Chinese to be modern, I think that is dissipating. I think they're pretty they're more and more at ease with the notion that this is not necessarily a problem. Do you get the sense we fixate here in the United States with their engagement with Western thinkers, but are they very much in conversation with, with others in the region who have confronted these questions in the last century and a half, particularly in the Chinese language? For example, Taiwanese philosophers, Taiwanese political thinkers, um, thinkers in Japan and Korea as well. Uh, are we missing that part of the conversation? I haven't looked specifically for that. That exists, but I think it's a little bit specialized. Uh, the mainstream guys, and the guys I'm looking at are the equivalent of David Frum or David Brooks, sort of, in our universe. They're basically in dialogue with the West. I'm consistently, over and over again, impressed by how much has been translated from various Western languages into Chinese. Uh, this started the 1980s, has continued apace uh, the wealth of material, monographs, et cetera, that's available to Chinese is absolutely astonishing. Uh, I saw this first when I worked on my first guy, Xu Jilin. 
uh, he he knows far more about French and German history than I do, even though I did some of that when I was in university. And it's just because he has that at his fingertips. So most, and then there was there's stuff on my website as well, for instance, about Black Lives Matter that they follow in great detail. And even the philosophers or the political thinkers behind various theories of Black Lives Matter or opponents of Black Lives Matter, I've learned things. I mean, I follow this to some with some interest because I'm an American. But here are these Chinese guys writing about it and citing people whom I've never heard of, frankly. So it is quite amazing the engagement with the West. Taiwan, now and again, don't I mention somebody. Japan, for historical reasons, not quite so much. It's uh, th there are people who specialize in Japan, of course, and take Japan seriously, and there are Japanese figures who come up with some frequency when they are talking about various topics, but the main players are still uh, Westerners and most mostly Americans, sort of the John Rawls tradition, that that, that sort of thing, among liberals particularly. Since the 1990s, the partly in reaction to the Tiananmen massacre, in fact, the CCP has increasingly turned to Chinese tradition in search of legitimacy. And as you say, to create new founding myths, now that the idea of tearing it all down in the name of revolution no longer flies. Um, Xi Jinping routinely speaks of China's excellent traditional culture. He drops classical illusions in his speeches. Every now and then he actually uses one correctly. You know, thinkers like Liang Zhiping, for example, who used to look primarily to the West for answers, are now embracing currents of thought that the CCP once denounced as futile. And so elaborate intellectual edifices for Chinese exceptionalism are also being built by thinkers like Yen Xuetong and others that are being used to defend the Belt and Road and challenge notions of universal human rights. How should we understand this inversion of the relationship of the party state to tradition and the ethical position that intellectuals occupy in what is clearly a state project? And how much of this is generational? Oh, those are great questions. Um, the role of tradition is there as a, to provide legitimacy now that revolution no longer does. Sooner or later, China's growth rates will fall. Uh, they can't sustain this high of a growth rate forever. They've been trying to shore it up in ways that don't require democracy. Tradition is a very available resource, particularly since it's also very plastic, it's very malleable. I mean, China has broken with this tradition in very emphatic ways over the 20th century. So uh, whoever talked about reinventing traditions, uh, Hobsbawm, right? I mean, that's what they do in China. So it's a state project, but it's also a project which is broadly shared at one level or another, another by many intellectuals, even liberals. Liberals will acknowledge that the, what you, what the flaw with liberalism is that it doesn't have an emotional component. We're all supposed to be rational actors and decide things on the basis of self-interest or whatever. And it doesn't have that emotional pull that tradition does. So lots of liberals try to re-engage with traditional themes to add that layer of nationality, social co cohesion, which can grow out of uh, this kind of sense of identity. The, when Yang Zhiping does this, that, that's a very good example. He does it at the same time that he criticizes it. Because the danger of this, of course, is that you get played, that they just make up anything and call it Chinese tradition. Or if they say dictatorship was a lovely Chinese tradition or abuse of dissidents was a lovely Chinese tradition. Well, that won't fly with everyone. So there are people who beat their chests and dress in Han robes on the weekend and uh, are all China all the time, trying to locate some kind of traditional essence that will mobilize people. Liang Zhiping is pushing back. He's trying to find 
intelligent ways to use tradition that do not sacrifice the entire 20th century Chinese experience. He wrote a very long piece on Tian Xia. Uh, he published it in a Taiwanese journal and I translated it it's on the website. It, it's like, it's almost a book. And he reviews a number of Chinese thinkers and how they use Tian Xia and what's good and what's bad about it. And he acknowledges up front that it's basically about producing an ideology. Um, and he is trying to make that work in a way that is intellectually honest. Uh, so saying that of course tradition matters, but we can't let our critical faculties go to waste just because someone raises tradition as a theme. David, um, we're getting a lot of requests for um, for your website. I wonder if you could just quickly uh, give us the URL for it, um, because I think uh, you've generated a lot of interest in the audience to follow up on on the work you've done. Yeah, it's just readingthechinadreamoneword.com. So readingthechinadream.com. No spaces in there. OK, great. No Thank you. Um, I want to turn to this idea of, you know, the liberal notion of the marketplace of ideas, because in, in some sense, you've said that that's alive and well in China, and we would do well to be paying more attention to it. Um, but that market is also highly regulated by an interventionist state that's not neutral, right? And as you might expect, it distorts the market, and it's created some really powerful incentives for opportunism. For example, we have the proliferation of academic centers dedicated to the brilliance of Xi Jinping Fong, right? Hundreds of them at universities all over China. And some of the thinkers that you follow and translate have hopped on this gravy train and are really monetizing their brands. Um, in, it literally is a marketplace of ideas in which they are becoming motivational speakers, they are talking to corporate boards uh, and, and cashing in on the opportunities that are available to them by kind of riding the gravy train of what aligns with Xi Jinping thought. Can you talk a little bit about how we've now entered a world in which Chinese intellectuals are very much participating in the market and cashing in? Indeed. What my friends complain about is that uh, you get big grants if you work on Xi Jinping thought. Money matters a lot in China. Uh, the state is invested massively in the best institutions. Professors are, seems to me, fairly well paid. They have villas in the countryside and, and I don't. And you know, they drive there in their Buicks and I don't. Uh, but <laughs> money is sort of everywhere. Even, um, even, um, liberals, it doesn't make any difference. You can go out and find, um, you can give seminars on the weekend. Uh, some of my friends do this to business types who are out for a little bit of cachet. So they'll know how to talk at a dinner party or they'll, or they're just interested. That sounds very patronizing on my part and I should correct myself. My friends say that these businessmen are vastly smarter than their students. And it's both great fun as well as highly lucrative. So that's out there. Uh, my impression is you get paid a lot when you publish in China. When you talk, you get paid. I'm always surprised when I give a talk in China. At the end of the talk, they give me a packet full of money, which almost never happens when I talk in Canada or the United States. So it's everywhere and there are lots of incentives. You can be misled, of course, by those incentives. I don't know. Uh, I haven't followed this as a particular research object or subject, so I don't have great stories about good people being who, who have gone bad following the money trail of Xi Jinping thought. Uh, I have looked more at people who take his thought more seriously. I have no idea how much money they've made out of that. This is not something that's easy to bring up over the dinner table, although perhaps I just should. Chinese can be very open about money issues. So maybe I'll try it next time I get a chance to go to China and have dinner with these people. We've got a huge number of questions. And so I wanna quickly just wrap up my, my um, piece here with, um, with a simple one, but maybe not so simple. And that is thinkers like, you've spent a lot of time translating thinkers like Yang Shigong, for example, um, who are collectively called the new left. 
Um, but to my mind, a lot of these labels have broken down in contemporary China. And when it comes to the CCP, there's a, re a, re a very real sense in which the party on the left has become the party on the right. Um, in what sense is Xi Jinping a Marxist or even a communist anymore? I think he thinks he's a Marxist and a communist. Um, what has struck me about Zhang Shigong, who I think writes, he's hoping to tell him what his Marxism is. Communism winds up being something like a Confucian dedication to purity of spirit and spiritual cultivation, which just sounds utterly ridiculous. But the notion is that if we're getting rich in China, then what do we need communism for? I mean, we don't want the workers rising up. We want the workers going to work. So the notion that you have nothing to lose but your chains, it's just, it's not the song we want to be singing here. So he wrote this long, Zhang Shigong wrote this very long piece in which he tries to co-opt, we talked about tradition a while ago. They was trying to make communism into some uh, upgrade of Confucianism. He does, it, it's, as silly as that sounds, he does it fairly well. If another thing that strikes me is that uh, I've been struck by how conservative most liberals are in China. We tend to think that a liberal is going to be somebody who thinks about the world in the way that we think about the world. Well, they do to some extent, but lots of liberals are very classical liberals. And even ones who are less classical are deeply worried, for instance, about identity politics in the United States, that that's going to make America unstable, that it's not the way of the future, that political correctness is terrible. Trump has lots of support in China and not just from people who hate the, Trump, the Chinese Communist Party. There are lots of Chinese liberals who think that Trump's battle against political correctness is what's going to save democracy and Western civilization. So um, many things are not what they seem to be. I agree with you. Thank you, David. I want to turn to uh, my partner in this venture and the project on China's global sharp power, Larry Diamond, uh, to open the Q&A portion of our program. And then after Larry, we'll turn to the audience. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, if you'll permit me, I'd like to ask uh, my own question and then uh, one from my colleague, Elizabeth Economy. So first to mind, David, thank you for this brilliant and fascinating presentation. You've talked about identity uh, and uh, you've alluded to uh, nationalism, but I'm wondering if you could uh, speak more explicitly uh, to the question of how this spectrum of Chinese intellectuals thinks about um, pride in nation, China's rightful role in the world, uh, and uh, how China should uh, relate to or eventually supplant the United States as the dominant power in the world and also uh, to what extent um, they're thinking about Taiwan as something that must be, quote, reunified with the mainland. I can't imagine they can get away with saying it doesn't matter, but if you could just talk about that nexus of issues. I think nationalism undergirds most everything. Three, uh, it, is allied with the emphasis on tradition that Glenn talked about a while ago. At the same time, something that has struck me as China's rise has continued and accelerated, I've expected, I was expecting a lot more triumphalism. You can find that, you can find that, that's for sure, that it is our time, it is our place, finally. But there's a lot of reluctance too. I think they're, now that they've gotten closer to to the, the Big Apple, as it were. Uh, there's a lot of them who say, we're not quite ready for this. China's not quite ready to lead. And they can't, I mean, sometimes they come out and say that directly. And there are huge differences in terms of where you are on the political spectrum, how you deal with this. Um, there's pushback against that too. Uh, Xu Jilin is quick to point out that the statism that China has been going toward for the last 15, 20 years 
brings them awfully close to fascism. So that kind of, when nationalism bleeds into statism like that, you're running the risk of replaying what Germany and Japan did during World War II. Or another way he pushes back, and this is quite frequent as well, is to say, if we pretend to be a world power, we cannot say that there are no universal values. We have to get in there and show them what our universal values are, debate them openly, and not just say every time, say, you know, somebody at the NBA says something about Hong Kong, we can't take our ball and go home. If we claim to be really a world power, we have to start acting like one, which is a way to fight back, I think. And I think there's a lot of people who think that way. And there's a lot of worry about China-US relations. Again, there's, there's, there's some crowing and some chest thumping, but the notion that this is really gonna fall apart, uh, the relationship that China and US have had up until the last 10 years or so, is deeply, deeply, deeply troubling from virtually every angle. Uh, the American market has been a huge source of everything, both to sell their stuff, to get our technology. American ideas are extremely important to, to liberals particularly, but across the entire spectrum. So I don't know if there's any way to generalize about it, but there, there does exist this full-throated nationalism, but there's a sensible doubt surrounding it as well. Taiwan is something, I think you're right. I don't know on what, there was a thing in the newspaper the last couple of days about this clubhouse, this uh, means mm -hmm. by which Chinese inside now trying to talk. And there they, they talked about it apparently. And I mean, there were smart people and open people in China and in Taiwan. Uh, I was interested, this, this brought me back to Trump. Apparently within China, a lot of people said, well, what about us? We're not the elites. We like things as they are. We like the Xinjiang policy. We like the Taiwan policy. Where's our clubhouse, you know? Uh, so there was this sort of populist pushback against the notion we can talk over borders, which reminds me of a lot of stuff that's happening in America these days. So, but in print, I don't know, I haven't read interesting things about Taiwan in print. It doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means I'm not subscribed. It doesn't come up on the stuff that I read. I think that's that's a step too far. Like saying saying Xi Jinping is an idiot on the public bus. You just don't do that. You just don't talk about Taiwan, except among your friends. Most of them are the Chinese people that I know love Taiwan. They they like to re retire to Taiwan. They they find the culture there very comforting to them. That that reminds them of what their parents were like and. The Taiwanese are at ease with being Chinese in a way that the mainlanders aren't. So I'm rambling on. I'll ask a little bit for next question. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to post a question that uh, Liz Economy, uh, our colleague, has asked. Is there a debate within China over what constitutes the China model? And if so, what are the lines of that debate? There certainly is. I think it has, I could be completely wrong about this. My impression is that this is a less, less of a hot topic than it was 15 years ago or so, but it's still out there. I think I'll just stop there. Otherwise I'll say silly things. Uh, if I find something, I will find Liz's address and, and let her know. Thank you. David, I want to pull a question out of the uh, audience's um, list of questions and, um, and possibly rephrase it. You know, we've been talking about intellectual thought in China vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world, but there's a very powerful domestic dimension to this too, in which Chinese intellectual thought must be thought of not purely as Han intellectual thought. There are other intellectual traditions at play as well, particularly when we're thinking about how Chinese intellectuals understand Xinjiang, Tibet, and other regions, which are still, you know, very complicated places within the, the borders of the PRC. Uh, is there space within this larger world of establishment intellectuals for those who are, are not um, talking about Han intellectual traditions and Han supremacy? To me, it's a very marginal space. Uh, my research project looks at very mainstream stuff. That's not because I like mainstream stuff. 
because I feel like dissident stuff has been covered extensively. In the stuff that I read, this rarely comes up. Uh, there is no space to talk sensibly about Xinjiang, as far as I can tell. Uh, there is a sort of undercurrent of romanticism about Tibet, the fact that that kind of Buddhism can be a means to find personal enlightenment. And apparently Wang Hui has written a book about Tibet that I didn't know about. I haven't mm -hmm. seen it. Uh, I may try to track that down, although I've spent enough time with Wang Hui for the last little while. Um, but no, I, I find that it is not something. In fact, somebody sent me a piece on minority policy, and I translated it, but it did not speak in any way to the stuff that we are interested in. To the extent that they can talk about it, you can write about the necessity to get past the Soviet minority nationality policy and go toward a greater integration that to get past ghettoization, to encourage a melting pot, like in you know United States or Brazil, you can find pieces like that. I'm not sure those are in good faith. They do not strike me as being people that have spent much time actually investigating the minority regions to know if they want to be melted into the pot or not. This seems to me like a cover for uh, less bad policies than what are being pushed on Xinjiang at the moment, but still very top-down policies about how they should define themselves. Uh, there are, there used to be on the left, I can't remember the guy's name, there's a left-wing writer who spent a lot of time in Xinjiang and who sort of compared their struggles with uh, Palestinians, for instance. I have that somewhere. Uh, so if you're looking for this, if you're looking hard for this, you might be able to find it. I am consciously reading sort of the New York Review of books or very mainstream, or not even that, hoity-toity, uh, just very middle of the road kind of stuff. And it's not something that comes up on my, on my screen. We're coming to the close. I want to ask you if you could prognosticate a little bit based on what you're seeing uh, in the here and now on the trends in Chinese intellectual thought. Where do you think the currents are leading? Uh, who are the dominant players and and what are the, um, the positions that are gaining the most traction, particularly uh, in this sort of um, I, I, I want to say post-COVID world, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but COVID has kind of scrambled the deck a bit. Well, it has scrambled it back a bit. It's very true. Although I have a sub project where I work exclusively on that. There's a part of the website that's, that's that dialogue or commentary has slowed down on that or last little bit. I think what will happen is that Xi Jinping thought or those who are shaping Xi Jinping thought will get a lot of press to the extent that they're smart, they will have a certain impact but my impression is that more broadly, most Chinese intellectuals anyway, identify as liberals of one sort or another. This doesn't mean they all wanna be dissidents or they wanna see the Communist Party fall, but they would very much like more freedom, less interference, uh, less tension. China is a very tense place these days. So they would like the state to back off and let them do what they want to do without having to worry too much about being accused of corruption or losing their jobs. I suspect a lot will depend on who succeeds Xi Jinping. Uh, as we've seen over the course of the last few years, one leader can make a huge difference, even on a country like the United States where we thought our institutions were very strong. If the person who follows Xi Jinping does not follow Xi Jinping, I think things could move back very easily toward a situation where there's a great deal more freedom of thought. Uh, that's what most of my people tend to want. Uh, that said, I think China is a thoroughly conservative country. The, the culture is really quite conservative. So the notion that they're going to move toward 
any kind of one man, one vote democracy, uh, I don't know, they might. Taiwan did it and Taiwan could be a model. Um, I wish I had smarter things to say about the future, but as an historian, I keep looking backward instead of forward. Thank you. Um, one final question, which has been nagging at me as I think about um, all of these um, thinkers as well, is how much uh, difference do you see generationally uh, among establishment intellectuals? There was an entire generation who came up in the 80s, for example, uh, many of them lawyers, in fact, um, who, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, uh, which is also sort of an interesting phenomenon, yeah. uh, who, who lean very strongly liberal. And then the generation <laughs> behind them very often does not share uh, in those predilections. And you, you, you hear much more nationalist and, and strident language coming from them. Um, can you explore that generational cleavage or, or is there in fact one there? I think there is, I think there is. Although just methodologically, I have a hard, I have a hard time finding the younger voices. They don't stand out as much. Uh, all the guys that I work on, most of them are, are my age or so. I'm making a conscious effort to, to find some on the left, it's quite obvious. Uh, the newer new left bothers less with foreign sources. The original new left was really into Frederick Jameson, really into a whole bunch of very woke people that, that many Americans worship. The newer crowd seems not to bother. Marx and Lenin is enough. Uh, on, among liberals, there's a guy named Shijian, who I've forgotten where he is in Beijing, who just wrote a book called Breaking the Cocoon. Uh, and he seems to be oriented a lot more toward electronic or digital stuff that uh, the older generation, people my age, are perhaps less comfortable with. And uh, so I think, yes, generations matter a lot. I mean, generational change has been so quick in China, you know? They define their generations in terms of decades, where we usually think of it in terms of 20 years, right? So um, yeah, I think that will make a big difference, frankly. Thank you, David Owenby, for a really fascinating talk. Um, I hope that um, a lot of our audience can go visit his website, readingthechinadream.com. Uh, and uh, and learn more because there's a wealth of information there. You're doing just you're you're doing fabulous work. We're all in debt to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.